Hat from Linux, and you might know Red Hat from OpenShift, and hopefully you know us from from a few other parts. But but what I really want to emphasize about Red Hat is that we don't know of any vendor uh, that really believes in ecosystems more than we do. Essentially, our business model is to take the combined work of hundreds of thousands of developers in millions of, of projects that we support and uh, organize them into sometimes new projects and sometimes uh, commercial uh, products that, that we sell. Now, uh, how we're different, we think, from other open source um, companies is really this, the dotted line uh, that, that hopefully you see in the, um, in the slide here. And that represents our commitment to always innovate in the upstream communities. So if we find a bug in software that comes from one community, we'll check changes and fixes in to that community instead of our derived products. That means you know you're always going to get the innovation in the community. Nothing is being withheld from you. End of commercial. Let's talk about uh, moving beyond rest. As a software professional, uh, one of the things I think, as software professionals, one of the things we all enjoy uh, is, is new things, new cool things. And we also enjoy looking back at the old things and talking about uh, how wrong they were or how much better things are now. So if you look at the innovations over the last, uh, say, 40 or so years that change interoperability, 82 being a seminal moment when the industry and government standardized on TCP IP. That was one of those cases where, hey, we're all doing something different now. Uh, we have democratization of networking. We can go across different platforms. We're no longer limited by value added networks uh, or uh, vSAM files. And then in 1989, uh, next big innovation would be web servers, the first time we do server-side coding. We're capitalizing on that TCP IP democratization to do distributed computing. And then that evolves into the three-tier architecture, which I'm gonna be talking about a lot in this presentation, where again, we, we got um, very proud of this new shiny toy three-tier architecture and we sort of looked dismissively at the ways things have done had been done previously, saying, you know, no, that's all wrong. That simple client server is incorrect. You really need a business tier and a data tier. And then we continue to evolve. In 98, we smugly said, uh, yeah, the problem with the three-tier architecture is you're using things like Corba and adapters and stored procedures that are tying you to vendors and tying you to standards that are holding you back. What we really want is something open and simple uh, like XML RPC, later SOAP, and that turned out to be not quite as simple as we thought it was gonna be. So uh, the first uh, innovation in my timeline here that I really think is still uh, relevant and thriving in present day would be 2000 publication of Roy Fielding's uh, dissertation where he talked about a new protocol represented what was it, representational state transfer or REST, which again, as TCP IP democratized networking, uh, REST has democratized this notion of uh, an API that's discoverable, shareable, understandable, and manageable. Continuing on with the publication of the Agile Manifesto, and then the first release of Kubernetes, we're, we're in a new wave now. We're in the cloud native development, microservices development, uh, two pizza teams, small units individually deployable. That's the state of the art uh, for development that is the culmination of all of these individual uh, innovations and in interoperability. So I'm gonna pick on the last wave. Uh, which is the three-tier architecture, because that is something we still have a lot of pervasively. We still have 
millions of lines of code uh, in application servers or their equivalents. And it seems like all new innovation is happening in new technology, but the, the reality is we have to live and grow uh, and accommodate three-tier architecture. Now, I know that uh, when you saw the title of my presentation, uh, you probably thought by moving beyond REST uh, that I was gonna talk about async API or gRPC or something like that. And, and those are great technologies, um, but I'm really referring to something more fundamental. Now, we've embraced microservice communications, and we have distributed systems that we really couldn't do in the application server era and prior. We have multiple machines collaborating, or VMs, or containers, uh, each with their own process space, each usually with their own database, each usually with their own development platform, uh, and they need to interoperate. So, the two pizza team managing my billing application uh, still needs data from the customer's database. And what's different now is that we don't share a database, we don't share a data tier, uh, we don't share a, a business layer. Uh, and so we have to rely on open standards for interoperability. Now it's true that the three tier era did feature uh, somewhat open standards, things like SOAP, things like CORBA uh, for interoperability, but there are some, some limitations there that on the synchronous side, the, the microservices emerging standards of have, have proven to be superior. So how do, what is the state of the art for interoperability for microservices development efforts? This is actually a slide that I presented uh, the last time I was uh, fortunate enough to, to present at an API Day show, and uh, I think it was it in Australia. Um, it really is a um, part of our agile integration uh, thinking here at Red Hat. So this is sort of the, a very simplified view of the microservices developer experience. So the microservices developers working on individual units, individually deployed units of software, uh, and you can think of them as these uh, sort of greenish hex here. And those are microservices that come through a DevOps pipeline. How do they interoperate? Well, when they need to get some data synchronously from other microservices teams, the standards around APIs, REST, JSON, uh, API management layers, those have pretty much ended the game. They rule the roost. We've established that uh, while we may evolve and while we're adding richer interactions like gRPC, we've done a really good job of addressing synchronous interactions between microservices. Now, the other branch of interoperability is this bottom gray layer, asynchronous interaction. Why do we have asynchronous interaction? Again, it's really to give developers flexibility. We need to interoperate, but we don't always need to interoperate synchronously. Sometimes it makes more sense to do a store and forward style inter, uh, interaction. And that's what I mean by, by asynchronous. Why do we do that? Well, so we don't have to go to the customer system every time we need customer data. Maybe we wanna store it locally in some kind of intermediate store, a cache uh, or uh, a streaming uh, application platform like Flink or Spark or something like that. And, and by the way, that's why you see the explosion in platforms, streaming platforms, correlating nicely with the explosion in microservices development. Uh, teams are saying, hey, uh, I don't wanna share any more data than I have. I'm not gonna give anyone else access to my database. So I need some intermediate uh, store to, uh, to, to capture that and keep it in a cache. And that's, again, this is really what we see as, as the state of the art today. So let me go back just for a second. When I presented this slide two years ago, we at Red Hat had just introduced our implementation of Kafka. 
And, and one of the things that we did uh, a little bit differently than a lot of Kafka vendors was we added a layer to our Kafka so that it could run on Kubernetes, marrying two of the most prominent technologies uh, with appeal for microservice developers. However, I would say at the time, uh, the, the notion of asynchronous interactions and event-driven uh, computing was, was largely unknown to a lot of even microservices developers, although there were a lot of microservices developers doing a lot of really cool things in this area. So let's look at what those developers are doing, event-driven architecture. Event-driven architecture is a way of designing applications to respond to real-time information by sending and receiving information about changes in the business reality of applications, very frequently represented as, as one of these sequence state diagrams. Something happens, and then uh, another application module uh, reacts as quickly as possible, possibly emitting more events that trigger uh, operations on for still more application modules. Now, many of you might be thinking, wait, is this guy talking about event-driven architecture like it's something new? Uh, and you'd point out that, uh, hey, in 2002, the Java programming language introduced event handlers as first class objects. And if you go back before that, 97, the first reactive programming language debuted, Haskell. Uh, actually, Fran, a variant of Haskell. 93, you can go back further, triggers were introduced. Make a change to a database table and some business logic fires. And then you go back to when I started programming, 1984, the Apple Macintosh. If you ever had to program an Apple Macintosh in the early days, it was very difficult. You had one big, what was called a main uh, event handling loop, and you had to handle with your code every event, a keystroke. Uh, a mouse click, a mouse move. Um, and then of course, some stalwarts would say, no, that wasn't the start of event-driven uh, architecture. Go back to the UNIVAC 1103, the first computer with operating system level interrupts where your code could be interrupted and some other uh, code could, could be interrupted. So EDA has been around a while. Why am I talking about it now? Well, the cloud changes things. How does the cloud change things? We talked two slides ago about interrupts and event loops and triggers and event handlers, and we still use those. And those are still important components of event handling and event-driven architecture inside programs. But they don't work in a cloud-native world. They don't work across those boundaries, across those process boundaries that we've embraced as microservice developers. Also, microservice developers demand more from their event management systems. They require data streams with replayability so that they can recreate those intermediate caches. And they require things like uh, standardizing those streams so they can apply that, that logic like Apache Spark or, or Flume or Flink to do streaming analytics applications. So what does work? How do you make uh, streaming applications that serve microservices developers? Well, you have options. Uh, there is uh, Apache Pulsar is pretty popular. Uh, there's some other streaming technologies, but really the emerging standard and one that again, marries very well with Kubernetes, the emerging standard for container management platforms is Apache Kafka. Kafka is a distributed system designed for streams, horizontally scalable, fault tolerant, and it's basically a commit log, a distributed commit log that all applications can subscribe to and pull uh, what they need to execute some action or rebuild their intermediate cache or what have you. A very strong uh, complement to uh, Apache Kafka and an event-driven application is change data capture. Another feature that makes uh, microservices event-driven architecture stronger. You know, Apache Kafka is a little bit like a telephone network. 
if you only have a few telephones on your network, it's not as valuable as if you have a lot of telephones on your network because you can reach more. In the Kafka world, it means you have richer applications that offer more insight. And a great way to increase that reach is with change data capture. So microservices, state-of-the-art streaming applications are built with Kafka running on Kubernetes plus change data capture, which is a series of agents that you can deploy to your databases that will automatically uh, emit Kafka events when there are changes to those databases. And we at Red Hat happen to think the best community for, uh, just as the best community we think for streaming technologies is the Apache Kafka community, we think the best technology for change data capture is the Debezium community. So we encourage you uh, to, to go to Debezium IO and participate and learn more about Debezium. So that gets us much closer to the ideal. How do we get microservices developers, uh, the nirvana of being able to share events uh, as successfully as we've been able to share APIs? But we can actually do better, do even better than Kafka plus Kubernetes plus Debezium. Those three things allow microservices developers to efficiently share and subscribe to events and reach into their brownfield applications and create more data to create richer insights in streaming applications. One more step we can do though. If you look at the state of the art for, uh, for development platforms in Kubernetes, uh, talking languages like Java and Node and Rust, they all have a programming notation for events. I mentioned earlier, Java introduced event handlers back in 2002. So, so all of these systems know what events are, even separate from event streams. I can raise an event. And in fact, in my personal career, my last programming job was about uh, eight years ago. I was a C-sharp developer uh, for an aerospace company uh, managing uh, basically cameras on drones. And we were programming .NET Windows applications. And, and it was my first introduction to concurrent programming because if you're writing a system that manages a camera, uh, Things have to happen in certain orders. The camera has to be booted up. Uh, your mission planning module has to be loaded. Your map has to be ready before you can start directing the camera. And so I learned all about inside programs, events that, that triggered code. And that's something we're all comfortable with, even if we've never used an event streaming system like Pulsar or Kafka. Well, this is where things have gotten cool because now we have a polyglot event-driven system for Kubernetes, and it's K-native. So it works really well, K-native events, I should say. K-native eventing allows serverless programs to respond to asynchronous events. In my Rust application that runs in a container, I can raise an event that someone else can respond to, someone else in that, that, uh, that K-native uh, or that Kubernetes cluster and maybe they're writing their application in Node. Again, this comes back to that theme of democratization. I can now share events across programming boundaries like we weren't able to do back in the three tier days. And if you embrace that and you're generating K-native events inside code that other developers can, can subscribe to, as well as you have Kafka events that are being published and subscribed to, then you can really do something cool. Then you can arrive at an event mesh, which I forgot I have this slide with the leading question. What if you could subscribe to an event no matter how it was published? K-Native, Kafka, JMS, uh, AMQP, something else. Then you again, you would arrive at an event mesh. And this is our version, our vision for the technology that's going to drive 
uh, the event driven, the asynchronous interactions of microservices developers to the same popularity that we have achieved with synchronous interactions of REST and, and gRPC uh, and, uh, and so on. With an event mesh, you have applications in this uh, second layer from the bottom. Uh, they're generating events. Uh, you have change data capture capturing events in, in your older systems. And uh, those are being raised in Kafka clusters, in Knative, in Kubernetes clusters, in they're being sensed by JMS brokers. They're being sensed by other messaging brokers that, that are uh, using uh, AMQP. And all that traffic gets, gets sent over a mesh that can then translate it to any other type. So from the developer's perspective, I raise an event and I can notify a lot of, of important consumers without them even knowing that I'm a Java developer using Knative or I'm a C++ developer publishing to Kafka. It's really that anything to anything publishing on the asynchronous side that we get uh, on the synchronous side by uh, standards like, uh, like REST and JSON. And again, running on your platform of choice, your cloud of choice, Google Cloud, Azure, Amazon Web Services, doesn't matter. Uh, On-prem, doesn't matter. And the secret sauce in getting part of that to work uh, is a relatively new project we've been fostering that, again, just like Debezium, I hope you visit and hope you participate, called Scupper.io. Scupper is really that secret sauce that allows you to move between Kubernetes clusters with no VPNs to worry about, no special firewalls. Uh, it's really the key to getting that traffic in the Kubernetes world to go to other Kubernetes worlds or to go outside. Now, of course, I've been leaving out uh, the all important aspect of security. That's a presentation for another session, but the event mesh covers that as well. Um, the key point is, again, anything to anything, uh, asynchronous communication. Oh, I guess I had a, one more commercial for Red Hat. Um, I am a part of Red Hat's application services teams where we work with a lot of this kind of technology and we have three branches, uh, Runtimes, uh, which is our platform for building Greenfield new applications that are cloud native, responsive, serverless, and so on. Uh, the integration branch of, of application servers services was where we have our event streaming technology, our API management technology, uh, as well as routing, transformation, and all kinds of features you need to, to bring in those, uh, those older and legacy systems into your streaming applications. And finally, uh, we also have event streaming, excuse me, we have uh, decision services and rules engines in our process uh, automation branch of the Red Hat Application Services Business Unit. So that was a whirlwind tour. Um, I know that I went through things kind of fast, but it's kind of hard to do in 25 minutes. I'm gonna leave you uh, with some resources that uh, you can find all on our webpage. Uh, we have published a lot on event-driven architecture. We published a lot on Kafka. Um, we've got more in the pipeline. And uh, please do visit Debezium, Scupper, and uh, the Kafka project itself and, and learn how microservices is moving in the direction of this polyglot asynchronous communications. And with that, uh, I'd be happy to take some questions. Okay, thank you, David. I think we've got time for one question. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat yet, but while we're waiting. So I'm wondering, um, David, Debezium and the mainframe, I've seen um, uh, change data capture as a really powerful tool for liberating 
uh, business logic from the mainframe. Does Debezium have an answer for that? Yes. Um, the Debezium community already features uh, DB2 in particular uh, as, a, as a component uh, that you can deploy to capture events on the mainframe. And there's more coming. Uh, we've got, you know, COBOL experts. Um, uh, we've got uh, IDMS, uh, a lot of the other mainframe databases in the community. And, and as those mature, we will uh, be furiously uh, productizing them uh, over in our uh, Red Hat uh, development teams. Okay, great. And um, scupper.io, I think that's something I definitely have to go and check out. Scupper with a K. Scupper with a K, right. Yes, it's interesting to see this uh, renewed interest in uh, event-driven architecture. And obviously, I think it's it's kind of waxed and waned over the, over the previous decades. And uh, we're getting back into an area where uh, events are, are really coming becoming a, a primary citizen of our systems again. Indeed. Okay. All right. Thank you, David. Um, I think uh, with that, it's time now for our next speaker, which is um, My pleasure. Dasit. 